Well, good evening. Please be for please start a lot. Is it still working? Good. Testing? Okay. Well, welcome to our Brooklyn District uh, Community Check-In. I'm Christy Kinsella, the Brooklyn District School Board member, and just thank you for those who came out tonight in person, and thank you to those watching the live stream at home who just want to stay informed and receive an update. I felt like um, it was time for a check-in with the Brooklyn District community. Uh, Mr. Schmidt is joining us here tonight, our Board of Supervisor for our district. This is also a Henrico County Public Schools, not just the Brooklyn District, but Henrico County Public Schools check-in. It's the fourth week of school, and there's not another board meeting until October 14th, so it's the perfect time to update you in case you've missed some of the changes or um, that we've made to some of our challenges. Maybe, may they be staffing, transportation, or contact tracing. We felt this was a good time for an update, as well as to hear from you. Um, any and all feedback. And um, my role here tonight is to listen and to advocate. I always say, if I don't know, I can't advocate for you and for what we need to better serve our students. Dr. Cashwell and her division leadership team will be answering the questions that you put forward, and I'll be taking notes as to any concerns that um, need to be discussed after tonight's meeting. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan Schmidt, Chair of the Board of Supervisors for Henrico County, to bring us an update from the government side. Good evening, everybody. I want to first start by thanking Ms. Kinsella for putting this together, and then secondly for extending an invite. I'm always glad to uh, to come join everybody here and give what I consider to be a really brief uh, state of the county. Um, it's it's a uh, I get to do it uh, regularly, but uh, we want to make sure we touch every piece of Brooklyn, not only every piece of Brooklyn, but every piece of the county. So glad to be here today. I, I did bring a few notes that I want to run through about what's kind of what's going on, not only in Brooklyn but in the county. And I promised Ms. Kinsella I'd be brief, but um, first of all, with Rec and Parks and Tourism, there's a few things um, I want to make note of. You know, the county hosted over 100 tournaments last year, uh, even during a COVID year, uh, to an economic impact of over $47 million, an amount that even in 2017 we weren't doing that. What economic development, what economic impact that means for us as residents is those visitors spend money. And it's another opportunity for us to generate revenue for our county in an effort to keep our tax rates low uh, for you and for me. Uh, so decent year in tourism. This year, 2021, is on track uh, to, to exceed that. My guess is back uh, in the $60 million economic impact of it. So good, good opportunity, a way to develop some, some dollars. Those meals tax dollars, as you know from visitors, they go directly to our schools. So proud to continue to support those efforts. A couple key pieces uh, of tourism and rec and parks would be the pool, the new pool of Regency at Nova that's opened up, a private public partnership. Uh, the more, uh, more water we can simply add to our county uh, for the use by our school folks, we can teach these kids in second grade to swim. You saw the pool that we opened up at the Eastern Rec Center, at the Frank J. Thornton Aquatic Center, and now with our partnership at Regency Mall, another pool, another water, certainly gives Dr. Cashwell and Ms. Kinsella and her colleagues an opportunity uh, to utilize it for the safety of our kids. Uh, another uh, Rec and Parks tourism uh, update for you all is the Virginia Center Commons project. The Virginia Center Commons project, if you're familiar with it, is a uh, Virginia Center Commons mall. We've purchased a piece of land there and we're building an indoor sports facility, about 12 basketball courts, 24 volleyball courts. Again, in that northern area of Henrico County, right on Route 1 and 95, in an effort to again develop our tourism portfolio a little bit. Uh, we are a little short of indoor courts and indoor space, as you all know, as you may know, we use these schools for a lot of our recreation for our community folks, and it'd be really nice to have a facility like that uh, to use for our, for our community groups that you want to use it for basketball, volleyball, and other indoor sports. And on top of that, I know uh, Dr. Cashew on the school board and school staff will be thrilled to know that when that gets completed, we can finally graduate our kids right here in Henrico County. Although I think they do love driving around that racetrack, I'm pretty sure. But we'll get them in a building, get them graduated right here in the county. And the final two on Wreck and Parks before I move on, right here in the Brooklyn District, Glover Park. 
Uh, Glover Park is set for a major expansion off of Greenwood Road. We're going to put four synthetic turf baseball fields, a dog, a dog park, Frisbee golf, uh, a really a nice, huge, nice playground, really some nice community amenities right there on Greenwood Road. The funding is already there, dollars are there, and just last week we passed the um, Army Corps of Engineers uh, environmental study, so we're ready to move on that. And then finally, an update on the Reckon Park side from Belmont Golf Course. If you follow the Belmont News, the county was spending your taxpayer dollars to the tune of almost a quarter million dollars a year in trying to keep a municipal golf course afloat. Uh, we signed a public-private partnership, the First Tee of Virginia, uh, they, the First Tee of Richmond. Uh, they, put f they, they promised to put three and a half million dollars into Belmont. They did not. They put four and a half million dollars into Belmont, costing the taxpayers now nothing. Still maintain the golf course, and they're doing a great job. Really a, a win for everybody as we continue to have green space right there at Belmont. Moving on to economic development again, our tax rate has not increased in, uh, well, since 1978. It's gone down a few times. Part of those reasons are the way we generate dollars on an outside, uh, an outside track, other revenue means. A quick update, and I, I came across this in our economic development. I was at an EDA meeting today, actually. 44% of people in Henrico that are 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree and 93% hold a high school diploma. One of the things we develop economic development here in our, in our county is the workforce that these folks can attract. You're seeing it with the Facebook expansion and the Amazon expansion. You know, Facebook uh, has built a huge data center out in the eastern area of our county that became Henrico County's number one taxpayer overnight. And Amazon, um, not to be outdone, has just purchased some land over by Richmond Raceway and they're building a 650,000 square foot facility, uh, the largest facility in Amazon distribution center I've seen in the, in the area. Expect to create a thousand new jobs and Amazon will become this county's largest taxpayer uh, of the top, of the next 10 combined. So when you see economic development like that in this county and, and the ability to recruit um, and recruit talent in this county uh, makes a certainly good economic impact for us as, as citizens. And finally, on the economic development standpoint, if you have any questions about Green City, I'm sure they want to answer those today too. It's a, it'll be the largest eco district on the East Coast. Uh, it'll include 280,000 square feet of retail located on 204 acres. It's the old best products facility right on 95 and Route 1. Uh, there'll be a 17,000 seat arena, hotel and conference center. It's taking a piece of land in this county that for the last six to eight years has generated zero dollars, not a dime of income for this county and turns it into a, to a living, literally a living, there'll be grass on the roof of these buildings. Uh, it'll be the most green arena in the world, in the Americas, in the Americas. So incredible, really thrilled to announce that. And then as I close, some really quick projects running around the district, Fire Station 20, right up the street here, if you haven't seen it, it's right here on the corner of, uh, by Blyley's of Parham and Staples Mill. Fire Station 20 is set to cut the ribbon in the spring. Uh, we're in the Bermuda Triangle of fire response. Fire 12, fire 15. This is the longest fire response in the county, right here on the corner, right where our government center is. And adding fire station 20 will be the county's first four bay fire station, 14,000 square feet. It really improves response time here in the county. Really thrilled to see that. The Fall Line Trail, you've heard about that? The Northwest Ashland and Petersburg Trail. And Michael right will be the first jurisdiction to complete that. We'll have about seven and a half miles of trail connecting Bryant Park to the Chickahominy River at the Hanover County line. Pretty thrilled about that. Those dollars are coming from the, from the federal government, the state as well, and we're working with our local partners, including Dominion, to connect those uh, those trails. Sidewalks come up all the time when I when I go to speak. Hanover County now has 260 miles of sidewalk. There are currently 43 sidewalk projects in this county underway right now. And over the next three years, we will add 16 miles of sidewalks and eight miles of paved uh, multi-use trails. In the Brooklyn District, Hungry Road is due for a sidewalk project. Hunton Park Boulevard and the Parham Road intersection um, are all due for, for, for sidewalks coming in the next few years. One or two of them are underway already. Cobbs Creek. Uh, I, I'd love to give you an update on Cobbs Creek. Cobbs Creek is a reservoir, a piece of land that our county bought uh, in Cumberland County. And what it is, it's meant to provide a steady water supply for us for the next 50 years. Water is an issue, folks, for our kids and our kids' future. We fixed that issue by securing uh, a 14.8 billion gallon regional water supply. The interesting part of this is the county will be pulling water out of the James River to the tune of 75 million gallons a day. And we can hold it in our reservoir at Cobbs Creek and then put it back in the river when we need to pull it out. Uh, and we do this um, at no fee to ourselves, of course. 
and we've been permitted uh, to go up to 75 million gallons a day. The cool thing about this is not only does it secure our water for our kids in this county for, for 50 plus years, it makes Henrico the ability to be a seller of water to other jurisdictions downstream, which is a huge, huge deal for us in the future. And then finally, Ms. Kinsella knows this, and, and, and Dr. Cashel, we've been working really hard on what is the next thing? What's the next 10 years for our county? And the bond referendum, there's a, there's a very good chance you'll see a bond referendum come back out. Yeah, remember, the last bond referendum was in 2016. This county, your county, has satisfied and sold those bonds already. That's how good a fiscal financial shape that your, your jurisdiction is in. I mean, you know, I'm not going to throw any thunder, but you know what we just did with schools in the past week or so with two new high schools and holidays, the, the gem that holiday elementary now is. Uh, we're talking about a next bond referendum and how do we continue this momentum that we've been talking about to the tune of, of course, as customary, the majority of the projects and funding will be allocated to in Niagara County Public Schools, of course, uh, but we will definitely address drainage to the tune of $50 million or so. And of course, address eight, our aging fire stations. If you've been paying attention in this county, we've built some pretty nice libraries recently with these bonds. And we've done a good job with some public safety amenities. We certainly have done a great job with schools. But it's really time to look at our fire stations, and we have a significant drainage issue in this county. I deal with drainage every single day, multiple times a day. So I sprinted through all the good stuff going on in your county right now. I do want to say thank you to Ms. Kinsella for the opportunity to come give that update. Uh, Ms. Kinsella and I are as accessible as we've ever been. If you have any questions, I'm glad to take them. But of course, I think everybody's got my cell phone number or email. You can ask them anytime you want. My last note that I brag about everywhere I go is what's going on in schools. I am going to stop right there because there's no chance I'm going to steal that thunder. I take that thunder every time I'm on the road, but I'll stop right there and let Ms. Kinsella and Dr. Cash and the fine staff here. Um, update what we've done in schools recently. But from a county perspective, I'm glad to be a guest here tonight. Thank you very much, Ms. Kinsella. Um, and on a general government perspective, your county is in good shape. We'll continue to work hard for you. And if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. Thank you all very much. Anyway, uh, and I uh, welcome all of those who are tuned in watching as well. And I uh, also want to thank Mrs. Kinsella for the opportunity uh, to be here and have some time at your check-in event this evening. Um, and I want to start by introducing a number, uh, as she said, members of the leadership team who have joined me here um, before we get started, because I know they're going to, um, you know, certainly whether it's through Q&A or some time after, we want to make sure uh, that you know who's here, should you have questions or thoughts you want to uh, direct to the team. So I'll start with our Chief of Family and Community Engagement, Adrian Cole Johnson. Woo! All right, we have got a cheering squad back there. I like the energy. All right, I also want to um, uh, introduce Dr. Beth Teigen, our Chief of Staff. Uh, John Wack, our Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Ingrid Grant, our Chief of Schools, and Dr. Leslie Hughes, our Chief of Teaching and Learning. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Michael Jackson, Principal of Permanent High School, for hosting us and uh, letting us be in your home here. We, are, we appreciate it very much and uh, always enjoy uh, time at Hermitage, so we appreciate it. You uh, let us use your building for other events quite a bit. I think I was in your library just a few days ago with uh, the superintendent's student advisory. So with all you've got on your plate, your team has on the plate, uh, thank you for allowing us to be here in your uh, fine uh, school. All right, so I'm going to have you, be, sorry, I wasn't sure how to get advancing slides. Okay, <laughs> so I did some uh, thanks opening up to Mrs. Kinsella. I also want to thank Mr. Smith for the update, uh, Super Roger Smith on the county. Really incredible things happening, and I'm going to enjoy highlighting a few of uh, the things that are happening on the school side, but I would be remiss if I did not begin my remarks by thanking our incredible Henrico County Public Schools team. Um, they deserve applause, accolades, and every bit of gratitude they can be offered uh, for the tremendous challenges they continue to overcome each and every day. Um, I think many of us, as we approach the spring and summer, thought we'd be looking at uh, things a little differently this fall when it comes to the virus and mitigation and, and the many challenges uh, that would be present this year, but they have risen to the occasion at every turn. And, 
so certainly our administrators, our teachers, our support staff, our bus drivers, double, triple, quadruple runs, um, our entire, our school nutrition team, everyone has been uh, working um, 100, giving 110% each and every day. And I know uh, that we are, are all grateful. And so I just want to thank you. And though we see you, uh, we appreciate you. And we continue to work to address a number of challenges that have come up and, and that um, some, some areas that we can continue to hone in on as we support your work and support uh, many of the obstacles that I know you are facing in the classroom. Um, and I'll also want to thank our community, our parents, our students. Uh, so thank you not only for enduring many inconveniences with some of our uh, late pickups and late arrivals and some other unexpected bumps here and there. Um, it, this has definitely uh, been a challenging opening on a number of fronts. And so we appreciate the grace and understanding and patience you've shown us as we've worked our way through uh, the opening to this school year. So just wanted to start with those those words of thanks. Um, and I know uh, Supervisor Schmidt alluded to what an exciting week we had uh, just recently when we were cutting the ribbons of three new school buildings, but I can't be at a Brooklyn check-in event and not mention this amazing project in Brooklyn. So um, you may be aware that the expanded Holiday Elementary has opened up the new building. You can see construction happening on the video behind me. Of course, it is now open to students on the first day. I got to spend some time there. Tremendous facility for teaching and learning. Just uh, world-class experiences offered in this building. One of, as I said, three ribbons we cut uh, with the new J.R. Tucker High School, the new Highland Springs High School, and also this phenomenal addition, which increases the capacity at Holiday Elementary. I'll also add that this building uh, houses our first, or the county's first dual language immersion program, Spanish immersion here. Uh, really excited about watching that grow in the coming years. Um, so really phenomenal things happening. We, it also happens to be a, a temporary home for the offices of our Henrico Virtual Academy as well. So. Uh, and a lot of new uh, preschool classrooms added there. So really excited about this um, expansion of the infrastructure of Henrico County Public Schools. So really a wonderful addition. Speaking of Henrico Virtual Academy, you know this is our inaugural year. We're very proud um, of our virtual academy. Um, you know, we really uh, worked hard in putting this academy together to make sure that we were going to do everything possible to create a school environment and a school, a unique school identity. Uh, so I know they uh, are excited about kicking off their year and are looking to do things like coming up with uh, logos and mascots and slogans and really getting involvement from the students. And while it serves that, um, the gamut from elementary through high school, really creating that feeling, getting an involved PTA. So a lot of great things happening. Uh, there and I will, you know, just like I'm out visiting our brick and mortar schools and classrooms, look forward to popping into some Henrico Virtual Academy classrooms as well. Um, you may know that because of the demand we saw that it the, um, asked for increased seats to virtual learning, uh, while our virtual academy had reached its capacity, we were able to um, serve some students through the Virginia. Uh, Virtual Virginia, I should say. I always want to say that backwards. Program through the Virginia Department of Education. So I want to acknowledge we have a number of students learning that way as well right now, uh, and we're, we were pleased to be able to support them in that manner through virtual learning. So I alluded to this earlier, and I think you see the slide behind me with the bus. Um, I feel like it's like the elephant in the room, the bus in the room, if you will, everywhere we go because uh, it is just. Uh, a challenge we have to acknowledge. There is a national bus driver shortage. If you're following the news, you know Henrico County Public Schools is not alone, nor is the Richmond region, nor is the state of Virginia. We see states where the National Guard's been called in to drive buses and help with transportation. Uh, if you are an elementary teacher or parent of a young child, you might have seen the bus, don't let pigeon drive the bus, right? But there you've seen on the internet, pigeons now been al allowed to drive the bus in some places. But um, all this to say, this is a real concern. It's a real challenge. We saw this coming many months before our schools uh, were open for the fall and have been doing everything we can to recruit 
uh, drivers. You may know that we do our own training for drivers, so um, you know we try to make it as easy as possible to say, hey, if you're interested, you're willing, you have the time to come drive a bus. We love to welcome new drivers to Henrico County, um, and you know uh, have hosted drive the bus events. Um, so if you haven't encouraged a friend or neighbor or someone who may have the desire to potentially drive a bus but they're feeling a little intimidated, I can say I actually got behind the wheel of a bus and managed to get through the obstacle course under the guidance of our expert pupil transportation team. They're incredible. They put me at ease. And so what I can say is if, if I can do it, um, I believe that uh, we have the right trainers on board to help uh, anyone who wants to become a driver and, and get those certifications. So. Certainly our recruitment efforts are um, aggressive. We have stipends uh, and bonuses out there to make sure that we're uh, enticing uh, folks to come in and give it a try. We also uh, have raised our hourly rate, our hourly rate. Um, and so, you know, we also, you may have followed, have purchased a number of new buses in our fleet. Really excited to be able to do that. And we've uh, leveraged some of our federal uh, ESSER funds to do that. Uh, to, to help us with this issue, uh, and also they have their climate control, so that's a good thing. More buses with seatbelts, climate control, trying to really make sure we have a state-of-the-art fleet for our drivers who are so deserving uh, of those quality uh, buses and, and to make the experience, of course, more pleasant for our students. So we continue to dig into that, um, and we'll tell you that, um, again, our, our drivers, uh, while we're experiencing the, sh the shortage, are just incredible. I know that uh, many times they're covering runs for one another, uh, doing runs in places they're unfamiliar with driving. Uh, they aren't, you know, as familiar with the students on the route, but they, they make it happen each and every day. So we're so very grateful for them. I continue to work towards improving that. I, I wanted to, on the health and safety front, just note that we do, on our Henrico Schools uh, webpage, have an area where you can go um, and check any number of things related to health and safety, particularly, I know there's a lot of interest in following uh, COVID cases, where they've been in schools and when. We do have a dashboard there. We have been uh, attempting to do real-time updates to that dashboard. That becomes challenging. Uh, because of the number uh, of a number of factors, particularly because we partner with our health department for contact tracing. So uh, we paused that dashboard for a bit of time to make sure we could go back and audit our data, make sure it's correct, and have moved to a once a week reporting. So you know when you're looking, you're seeing the most accurate up-to-date uh, data and that uh, we are continuing to provide uh, transparency for our community uh, related to those cases. You can also find um, our updated guidelines related to um, procedures for contact tracing uh, and quarantining. There's a flow chart there uh, to help you kind of see what's in place. And there's always a date at the bottom. So if something changes in relation to our health department, or our health committee, uh, we would make those changes there. And so um, you can always make sure you're looking at the latest up-to-date uh, information on our webpage there. There's been a lot of, of news out there related to um, testing programs through uh, state-funded programs and otherwise, and so wanted to just provide some information there. I know our Dr. Teigen and the Health Committee have updated the board on this along the way uh, at board meetings, but thought this would be a topic of interest. Uh, we are receiving, as part of uh, the state's VISTA program, some screening uh, at-home testing kits in the near future. So um, our hope has been that if someone is uh, has to go home to quarantine, a student or someone has been exposed, that we're actually able to send home the kit so that there's access to that testing at home and there's also kind of a telemed component there uh, as well. So uh, we really think that's a, a great help to our families and our staff to make sure those kits are readily available. We're looking forward to receiving those um, and then there'll be a process for making sure we distribute those uh, to our schools for their use. So. Uh, we can take more specific questions about that later, but just wanted to put that on your radar. And then another piece of that uh, testing program that's not yet available, I think they have an October or late October date, and of course we've been expressing interest uh, in learning more about that and how it could work for Henrico County is related to doing screening uh, on a more regular basis. So this might be for athletes, for example, or um, uh, it can be done in a number of other ways. So we're certainly looking at 
uh, more comprehensive screening testing as a, one of our many mitigation strategies that we continue to employ to make sure we're keeping our schools safe and reducing the spread of COVID-19. Um, what was next on that? Did I cover? Oh, okay, I covered all the safety pieces uh, for now. And, and I just want to also um, highlight again as we've uh, returned to the classroom, virtual classroom or in-person classroom, uh, but returning to the new school year, um, something that's been really important to the entire central team and I know to our building leaders as we sort of set the focus for this year. Um, and that's understanding a lot of trepidation uh, that we know our families and students were feeling uh, coming into the year. You saw so many headlines about significant learning loss and learning gaps and a lot of focus on what kids weren't going to be able to do when they came back to school. But I want to tell you that our team and our schools have been focused on the talents and gifts that students bring to the table and I know our, our teachers feel the same way and making sure that we're ready to meet students where they are. So whether uh, the time during the pandemic they returned some face to face, they remained fully virtual or had any uh, number of circumstances that might have caused some gaps in their learning. In some cases we saw students uh, soar with virtual learning and actually accelerate through some self pace but that no matter where students are, what their circumstance, that we're prepared to meet them where they are when they come into our classrooms um, and that we're providing again those wraparounds uh, and supports as needed so all of our students know uh, that they are valued and appreciated for the many gifts they do bring to the table and bring to the classroom um, despite what some may dub as learning loss. So uh, just wanted to to make sure you understood that was very much our focus going into the year and while we're a number of weeks in if that's still a concern families have I or students have I want to make sure we alleviate that we of course ran a really robust summer academy this year which we opened to all students um, you know who wanted to attend we'll continue throughout this school year you'll see a focus on um, some more tutoring remediation opportunities than you may have seen in the past and then of course through the summer uh, again we'll look to uh, offer a really expansive uh, number of opportunities for students so that everybody feels like they have access to the supports they need um, academically and a lot of social emotional supports in there as well because I think uh, we recognize that, that both of those opportunities matter. All right, speaking of supports and wraparounds, I am going to turn it over to Adrian, who's going to uh, give us some updates related to our family and community engagement efforts. All right, Adrian. Thank you, and good evening, Brooklyn District. Um, again, Ms. Kinsella, thank you for having us here. It's great to see so many faces and community members out on such a beautiful, a beautiful day. So again, I'm Adrian Cole Johnson, Chief of Family and Community Engagement, and just want to talk a little bit about not only our efforts, but really the efforts of ACPS when it comes to supporting families and community. Um, what you'll see on the screen is really our commitment. I always tell people, even if you don't remember my name, remember three words, build, bridge, and boost. And so our effort is really to um, build relationships, and I always say resource-rich relationships, um, so even beyond the financial aspect, and Rico is such a rich county, and so how are we working together to build those relationships and to connect? Um, also, when we're looking at partnerships, so partnerships and collaborations, um, often you think about organizations and even nonprofits that are doing work, but even the partnership and collaborations that, that's necessary for parents um, that are really um, front and center in the homes and supporting our, our young people. And last but not least is the transformative family engagement. Um, ensuring that what we're doing in schools is linked to learning. Um, if anyone, I know I'm a parent of a third grader and the, the learning is a bit different now. And so I'm looking for family engagement activities that are gonna really make sure things are square so that I'm learning more about what's happening um, in, in the classroom. Um, and so what we're looking at is really, it's a community school framework. And this is a, a national model um, that's really all about um, four pillars. And so, I always look at, um, imagine a rotary phone. Um, and so when you pick up, you call, someone may answer, they may not. You may have to wait a day or two for them to call you back. Um, but we're really looking at more of a smart, a smartphone approach where the apps are connected, um, information is connected and synthesized. And so, and RIPO is really going to a model where you're looking at a community school framework 
Um, within those pillars, of course, there's family engagement and making sure that we're actively doing that. Um, there's also integrated student supports. And so you heard a little bit of that earlier, um, but what you'll see with the integrated supports and also with that collaborative leadership, which is another pillar, is how are we working across departments and divisions to make sure that we're supporting our, our students? Um, you know, when I think about transportation that was mentioned earlier, you think about nutrition services, technology, ensuring that our students are connected in that way, and even a lot of our um, social emotional learning support that our social workers and counselors are doing, just making sure that we're really connected and, and able to support. All right, and we'll quickly go through these slides. Some schools in our county have family advocates, and so they really are the forward-facing um, staff through our department. I know we'll be getting one soon here at Hermitage, um, and always looking to expand that. If you don't have a family advocate in your school, principals have been very intentional about identifying someone in the school that serves as a resource coordinator. Um, and so I'm always um, sure to share with parents and families even if there's something that's happening that may not seem school related, there's likely someone in the school that can really connect you to other services um, throughout the county. And this just again, when we look at what our family engagement looks like, um, and as I shared earlier with the link to learning, some of the aspects that we try to look at. So of course we wanted to be integrated. We wanted to make sense with what's happening with your students in their, in their classroom. Um, we want to make sure that it's impactful, right? And so making sure that if you're coming out and spending your time in the evening or even early in the morning, it feels like it makes an impact in your home. Inclusive and as individualized as possible because we are one amazing, huge, and diverse county. And so what you may see happen in one school community may vary, um, varies from another. And last but not least, when we think about some of our um, family engagement, one thing that we do on a division-wide level is we really take some of the feedback, concerns, and even interests of our, of our community, and we um, provide what's called the Bridge Builders Academy. And so um, this, se this session, we started doing some hybrid opportunities, some virtual and some in person, where we're really gathering with parents, often partners are presenting as well. And so um, we'd love for you all to if you check out the website. There's a link to all the information there. We kicked off last week, but then again, just another opportunity to really engage um, with HCPS amongst um, other parents and staff as well. And that's it. Thank you all so much. I think I'm passing it over to Ms. Kinsella so we can get started with some questions. Before Ms. Kinsella comes up, thank you. Uh, I was remiss in introducing someone, and we had someone walk in late I did get to introduce, so I want to make sure I take an opportunity to do that. When I was introducing the leadership team, I missed um, our Chief of Operations, Lenny Richard, he was sitting sort of off to the side out of my sight, but I, I apologize for that. And Dr. Monica Manns has come in as well, um, so I wanted to make sure that I introduce them, particularly as we move into the next section. And thank you, Dr. Um, Dr. Cashflow, Mr. Schmidt, Adrian Cole Johnson, thank you for being here this evening. And now the last hour is, is what we're here for, the community check-in piece. If you have not already heard what you came to hear um, and your, your concerns are resolved, or if you have anything positive to share with us, we'd love to hear that too. Everybody loves some kind words. Anyway, without further ado, if you have questions, um, there are microphones set up staff, with staff. They're gonna come to you, so if you just raise your hand, let's get started. Is what is the plan um, 
This constituent doesn't believe that the, well, new capacity was not necessarily added at the rebuild of Tucker High School, nor was capacity added at Holland Springs High School. I think I'll let um, Mr. Lenny Pritchard come up, Chief of Operations, as we're currently working on the capital plan now to bring forward for the bond, which would be addressing new capital projects. Mr. Pritchard. Thank you. Um, this is something that we're keeping a steady eye on with the capacity numbers that we have in our schools right now and looking at our enrollment numbers. We do know that we do have a new elementary school that's going to go up right along the Brooklyn Fairfield line that's right there in River Mill. So that would help some alleviate some of the elementary school capacity there. Uh, we are working with county planning to make sure that we don't miss a spot if there was the potential need to look at a development for middle school. Uh, or, or uh, I don't believe the numbers are going to equate to a new high school or anything like that. But we are keeping an eye on those numbers, and if something does come up, and it's something that we have to push forward, I know that we have the full support of the county um, to move forward and make any kind of decisions that we do to help with capacity issues and all the problems. you came out tonight to share that with me. Um, let me know. I work for you. So you just let me know how I may best support you outside of um, the support you could be receiving from your teachers and your principal at your school. But thank you so much for those kind words. Hi. Um, I would also, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I'll just share as a teacher here at Hermitage, um, I told Dr. Jackson this morning that um, it's been the best thing to have the kids back in the classroom because it has filled our tanks and they are so happy to be here. So thank you for you know dedicating and, and trying to make that happen for not just teachers but students as well. So thank you for that. Um, but I do also have a question. Um, you know, in, in this effort, we know there are staffing shortages. Um, we have them here at Hermitage. We have an English position open. Um, but the substitute shortage has been very trying on teachers. Um, we have spent, um, I, as English department chair here, um, I just came off a stretch of seven days of figuring out who's going to cover classes. Um, so teachers have lost their planning periods. I know there are other department chairs here as well who are in charge of much smaller departments. So it's much more difficult. So if you have more than one teacher absent, um, and I think what we're finding is we were maybe fearful that it was going to be teachers out because of their own personal health, but we're finding that it's their children. Uh, daycares are closed. Their children have to quarantine. And so the mom, the mothers and fathers who are teachers are also, they're also having to miss for those reasons. Um, and so I think teachers are in a position of, we've always done this and we've done it willingly, um, but now we're in a place where how long can we do this? How long can we go throughout our school day with no planning period? And just to add to that, and this was totally unrelated. Um, it was not connected to this at all, but I had a teacher from another neighboring school reach out and ask, you know, how is your school handling, you know, coverage for teachers? And he shared that he had only had one planning period since the school year started. Um, and so I think it becomes an issue of, we've always done work at home. We've always spent time, you know, dedicated to our profession, our career. This is a job we love our kids we'll do anything for them 
Um, but at what point do teachers feel like they're being either compensated, um, the money's not being spent on substitutes because I think we're averaging three teachers absent every day with no substitutes. So the money's not going towards substitutes. Is it possible for teachers to receive compensation for coverage or something to acknowledge teachers we see what this is what this is doing to you? I don't know what other way to say it, but so you've said it very well. And, and I hear you. Uh, and it's certainly uh, this is something we're incredibly aware of. I know that you're the entire team you're looking at here. This has been on our agenda at every leadership meeting. We've been looking at the data of unfilled positions and absolutely understand the toll it takes on um, staff when, when they're having to cover. And so uh, we went into this school year leveraging some of our federal um, ESSER funds to add permanent substitutes, but we know that even that, even that has not bridged the gap like we hoped it would. Something we've just done is work to allocate additional funds to, to, to hire more permanent substitutes for our buildings. Um, and then absolutely to your question, uh, about compensation, that's something we've been really examining as well. What are the mechanisms for doing that? So um, it sounds really easy for us to say, yeah, we want to pay teachers for doing that, but we need to make sure we have a mechanism for tracking it, that our payroll systems are set up to do it, do it correctly, accurately. Um, and so we're looking at any number of, of ways. And certainly, um, I understand that while compensation would be nice, you don't want to miss your planning period. And ultimately, that we know that's the problem we need to solve. But also wanting to acknowledge the extra burden that this has put um, on our staff is at all levels uh, and, and all across the county. So we're hoping the additional permanent substitutes will begin to hopefully eliminate the need to have to cover. Uh, but when you do, what is the mechanism we have for making sure that we've considered the compensation angle and the team is actively exploring that. Um, so it, thank you for articulating that uh, challenge so well. It is absolutely, I, I know that it has been a strain and you're right, I, you step up and do it and your colleagues do um, and our students are the beneficiary of your efforts, but I absolutely understand that it's far above and beyond uh, the call of duty there. Good evening. My name is Natalia, and I'm speaking from a parent perspective and sort of to piggyback off of what uh, this teacher was uh, speaking to. Um, with regards to special education, um, there also seems to be a shortage of instructional assistants. And that's a huge concern for parents um, of students in special education because, for example, um, my son was very successful in his ecology class online uh, last year, and that was largely due to um, the fact that he had a very assertive and very helpful instructional assistant. But I'm hearing, and it's, it seems very clear, that there is a shortage. And I'm hearing that sometimes he does have an instructional assistant to go with him to his oceanography class, and sometimes he doesn't. So what um, recourse is there for parents who learn of this, and then they reach out to um, the powers that be, and, but yet no response? Um, it's very concerning. Um, to, to me specifically as a parent, because I want to make sure that he is very successful. This is his senior year, and, um, and that he, he, ha he has the, the best support system in place. His teachers are excellent, but when I'm hearing things like the teacher is cut, you know, may have to cut her for an instructional assistant, well, that kind of takes away from the teacher's time as well in, in terms of what they're doing as far as instruction. So if you can speak to that, or somebody can speak to that, that would be great. Um, and also, so the, um, another piece is also, there seems to be a disconnect with the, the COVID check-in, uh, wellness check-in uh, checklist, as, and then uh, the HCPS health and safety checklist for students who are ill, um, as far as the, the questions that are, that are on there, for example, the flu-like illness, um, with or without fear, for example, um, and then the, the uh, COVID checklist says if, if they have a, a new um, cough or cold that is not related to, to COVID, then they're allowed to go to school. But then this checklist says that, they're, that if they do exhibit these um, symptoms, that they should remain on the brow. So there seems to be a disconnect there. That can be looked at as well, because it's very confusing for parents um, and can possibly be confusing for administration and teachers as well. 
Thank you. We've taken note of, of your concern related to those checklists. I know Dr. Tigan, who heads up our health committee, has taken note of that and uh, certainly know you're hurt. And, you know, I would certainly recommend it, and we're happy to, uh, to have Dr. Grant and Dr. Hughes touch base with you personally after this to learn a little bit more about the situation uh, you're experiencing uh, related to your son and make sure we offer you some specific guidance uh, there. We're happy to help. Thank you. And the circle assistant, please. I mean, certainly, in relation to that, you know, I think we would want to better understand uh, how we can help support you in that process. But um, absolutely, we continue to make sure that we're filling all the vacancies we have and providing those supports. And so, uh, certainly, there may be some situations uh, where uh, there are some vacancies with instructional assistant positions. But we understand how critical they are and want to make sure that. Uh, in the absence of the assigned instructional system, there's another support available. So I uh, would love to, to learn more about your son's situation. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, first of all, I want to say this is an awesome place to work at Hermitage. We have an awesome principal, Dr. Jackson. So we are in good hands. And, um, you know, he's done an awesome job getting the school year going. Speaking to my colleagues' um, comments about subs and lack thereof, I know that Chesterfield is actually compensating teachers $30 an hour to cover classes, so you may reach out to um, folks across the river and find out exactly how they're doing that. They, they started doing it last year, according to um, a friend of mine who teaches at Cosby High School. Um, and certainly, <coughs> there's unused um, sub, sub money, so I think that may just could be reallocated. Um, another concern um, of, of some of the staff here that hopefully you can speak to is three of the high schools in the county went to a new uh, schedule this year where teachers are teaching six, six classes as part of their regular contract, where the other six high schools in the county are teaching the regular five classes. So if you're a teacher at one of those schools where you're teaching five classes and you pick up an extra class, um, another point two, you're compensated, you get an extra contract, uh, a stipend uh, for the additional six class. And teachers at the three schools where we're already teaching six classes are not being compensated. There's no stipend. Um, and knowing that HPS, one of the four cornerstones, is equity, I'm wondering if you could speak to that and explain to the staff at three high schools where, where people are teaching six classes with no additional compensation how um, that makes sense in terms of equity. Thank you. to the team to see if someone had some specifics to add there. I mean, I would certainly say um, I can't speak to that specific situation, but I'm happy to look into it and learn more so that I can address it. And would we'll just mention that, you know, there may be some questions you bring forward or concerns you bring forward here and now that uh, I don't have an answer for on the spot, but the team and I will absolutely follow up with you and get back to you. But um, I know that they were, had looked at a different schedule uh, at, at certain schools. And, Oh, you're coming up. I'm not going to speak for you. Never. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Ingrid Grant, um, Chief of School Leadership. Yes, there are three schools currently piloting um, six classes. And one of the reasons for that, with our high school redesign, we heard from our students, um, they wanted more choices to be able to take classes with CTE, giving them opportunities to have different um, pathways for colleges. Um, and giving some of our students who are struggling to graduate on time the opportunities to have an additional class so that they can graduate with their graduating class. That is something we would take into consideration um, this school year, see how that works out, because it could be a possibility we look at other schools going in this direction also. When we think about um, where we going as a district, student choice, student voice, that's what we took into consideration when we decided to add that additional class. And when it comes to compensation, that is something we would take under consideration. Did I answer your question? So, okay. We will take into consideration um, everything you saw, you um, said, and talk to our principals and our director of high school and look into it.
and we and we will follow up. We will follow up. potentially in conjunction with uh, Mr. Wack, um, our CFO. Great, qu great question. Yeah, so hopefully I can uh, do it justice. Certainly, um, you, are, you are correct. We do uh, work in partnership with county government, and so as we enter each budget cycle and we look at employee compensation, and, and by the way, uh, your school board is uh, champions at all times, as do I, making sure that when we are um, looking forward to adopt a budget for the upcoming year that we are considering compensation and any of the challenges within, particularly related to, co to compression. And so um, uh, I think it's been about, I'm gonna get the years wrong, about three years ago, uh, the school division in partnership with county government worked to take a first stab at some compression across the scale. I'll tell you that there's no such thing as fixing compression. Uh, when you really try to unpack a scale, you can make strides, but um, it's sort of sometimes uh, one of those things where, um, uh, you know, it's such a massive undertaking and there are so many nuances to the scale, especially with an employer as large as Henrico County and Henrico uh, County Public Schools. Um, so they began to take, uh, take chunks um, uh, of the project underway and so particularly looked at teachers in that first uh, stretch. So uh, made a good bit of headway there. And then of course, moving into uh, the budget cycle for the, the current school year that we're in, I, I am pleased to say that based on the advocacy, um, not only of supervisors and the school board, the budget that was passed and went into effect this, this school year did continue to address compensation as well as um, made uh, some compensation increases for all employees across the board categorically. And I'll tell you, that was historic in a number of ways. One, you know, obviously in March of 2020, when things came to a grinding halt, uh, our budget was slashed like every county budget. We, we went into uh, uh, armor mode to make sure we were protecting ourselves, not understanding what local and state revenues would do. Um, and uh, as you uh, heard in Supervisor Smith's uh, uh, overview, we've been able to accomplish great things, but it's because of that fiscal prudence and uh, really operating carefully uh, particularly through the pandemic to make sure that we were uh, really paring down to the bare necessities. We did not, uh, as some uh, neighboring localities late, we did not furlough or lay anyone off during the time of emergency closure. That included our temporary staff. Everyone remained on our payroll. Um, and then while we did have to make a significant number of budget cuts, we worked to restore all of those going into the next school year as well as um, see across the board increases uh, for all employee groups. And um, I think that while uh, articulating percentages and increases can be challenging in any good year, uh, I think while there was a lot of good news in our compensation uh, increases for the year, it may have been complicated to understand because it came in a series of what I would say uh, a series of pay adjustments the third of which has not yet happened for many employees. And so I know that's a head scratcher um, and that kind of speaks somewhat to the UPP, right? So uh, we do, when we're adopting these budgets, it's in sync with the entire county government. What's unique about the schools is we have a lot of 10 and 11 month employees. That's not the case on the other side. And so when we look at how funds become available uh, into the budget to go into the increases, um, they often will work on a quarterly appropriation. So that kind of fits oddly into our fiscal year. 
um, but it doesn't mean the money doesn't come. It just means the timing may feel a little bit bumpy where typically in schools everything happens like July 1 or at the start of a teacher's contract year. So um, going into this school year, the pay increase was a, in effect for everyone, but there were a number of additional increases that applied to some groups, for example, the longevity increase. And so some of those pieces come to, into being in December. I want to get the paycheck right. This, the December 15th paycheck. So that finishes out that compensation increase. Um, and so while uh, it was, a, as I said, um, an incredible compensation package, I know it was a little hard to untangle. And so, uh, Mr. Rack, do you want to kind of talk about what the general increments and increases were? And it did work to address that second piece of compensation, which uh, a compression, which we didn't get to in the first study, which was really looking at veteran teachers. And that's where the longevity piece came into play. And actually, the longevity increases were across the board for all employee groups, not just our instructional staff. Yes, just to be a little more specific regarding teachers, uh, all teachers received a 6.9% increase in April. Um, when we looked at the, the longevity increase that Dr. Cashwell spoke of, over a third of our teachers are, are receiving those increases. You'll see them in their December 15 paychecks for the 10-month for the employees, and those increases are up to 9.83%. Uh, that, that depended on the number of years of service everyone had at, as of January 2021. Uh, but in terms of the unified pay plan overall, uh, I, I would say it's atypical uh, for, for local government to try to be in sync with, with its uh, school division. So if, for example, county employees received a 2.3% incre salary increase, that, that the school's employees would generally receive the same. So uh, we, we do, we do uh, stay in sync with the county in, in terms of the, the annual budget process and also uh, the unified pay, pay plan with, with direct salary increases that, to all employee groups at the same time. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Riddell. I'm a nine-year bus driver in Racco County, zone number three. I wasn't going to talk about this compression thing since you brought it up. <laughs> um, I've been here nine years, and I just got a raise to what a brand new bus driver starting out is making. So that doesn't make me a very happy person. I know um, I've heard the definition of compression quite a bit, but I wanted to state that because we're the ones getting your kids to school. And just to let you know a little bit about that, I go to Deep Run Hub, I go to Glen Allen High School, Hermitage High School, Tucker, Moody, Springfield Park, two runs at Twin Hickory. Now we all know that we're doing double and triple runs. That was expected this year. None of us bus drivers, none of the tenured bus drivers expected anything less than that. And to be quite honest, you know, are we, is it taking a toll? Yes, it is. But it's the only way that we can get your kids to school. We've got to do this. So it's something that, you know, it's something that we accept. Um, just like the teachers are overworked, we're overworked as well. I do have a couple of questions. I want to find out about the mask, the mask policy. I had a child getting on the bus today, refused to put a mask on. I have a lot of masks. Handed him the mask and he said no. Went back to my supervisor because I'm, I'm now not happy. I'm wearing a mask. All the other kids are wearing a mask. This child wouldn't wear a mask. From what I understand the policy is, let him on the bus. To ride a school bus is a privilege. That's not a given. It is a privilege to ride a school bus. So I'd like for somebody to address that. Also, with COVID, there have been quite a few buses that have been quarantined. So all the children are at home. But when, when we take the bus back, they give us a new route. We continue. We're not quarantined like the children are. We're given another entire route to do to take the place of that one. A question that I like answered as well. And the main thing, 
paperwork. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware, the paperwork that we do as bus drivers is immense. It's crazy. I worked Sunday from noon until 12, 12.35 a.m. Monday morning. Week before, I did not go out of my house Saturday or Sunday. We're doing seating charts that are absolutely crazy. Try to get 52 kids to stay in the same seat. It's impossible. You can have police on the bus. It's impossible. They're not going to stay in the same seat. We're doing counts when the children get on. When a child gets on that bus, we, take, we have a sheet with their name on it, hopefully their name is on it. If it's not, then that's another whole problem we have. And we check them all. This is done at every single bus stop. So you can imagine the delays it's causing in the traffic. I mean, let's face it, the general public already hates seeing a bus stopped because you're going to be there for a little bit. So when we have to take these names and then call it in on radio and say, uh, John Jones just uh, is here to get on and they're not on the list, that's got to be checked on the radio brought back to us. If the parent is there with that child, we don't take the child. If the parent is not there, we take the child. These things change constantly. And we all know this is a COVID year, so the only thing constant is change. As bus drivers, we're used to that 24-7. It's what we do every day. The problem is, you're trying to drive a bus. You're looking at seven mirrors. You're making sure that when that child gets on the bus, that they don't drop something and run across the street or some crazy thing because they're, they're like little ants. They go all over the place. Because people are passing us every day with that cross on our mouth. In fact, the lady that passed me today when I was picking up her children decided to shoot me the bird the whole way across in front of my bus. That really makes you feel good when you're picking up 38 kids at one stop and one of them's hers. She passes in front of the bus. This is what we put up with on a daily basis. On top of the paperwork that we take home every single night to update a seating chart that, oh, by the way, the ones that I worked on Sunday I told you about, I got a phone call Monday morning at 9.30. Uh, he got one, she got one as well. That all changed. Like three different, thing, three different schools changed. So you go home in the middle of the day, you take care of that. Two o'clock, we get back on the bus, we got called in more changes. It's impossible for us to do this on the bus. And that's all I have to say. If anybody can give me some answers, I would appreciate it. Well, first, Ms. Riddell, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for um, driving a bus. You and every other bus driver that we have that currently drives for Henrico County Public Schools. And secondly, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your advocacy. I want to thank you for coming to the board meeting last week and sharing concerns that you have because, as Mr. Pritchard is about to come forward and share with you, some changes have actually been made since you spoke at the meeting last week. So thank you for speaking up and bringing these things forward so that we can better serve our students and definitely keep everyone on our buses safe. So just thank you, Mr. Pritchard. Thank you. And I, and I also do want to thank you for everything that you and your fellow co-workers have done to get our kids to school every single day. Um, where to begin? Um, started off with masks. Masks are required to be on the bus. You, you do have the expectation to do it. If a child does not do so, you need to notify the administrator at the school so the administrator can deal with it. Riding a bus is a privilege that needs to be taken care of. If it's something that doesn't go, if it was a notice, contact its own supervisor so we can reach out to them and start uh, working with them to make sure that these things happen. They should wear a mask. Um, as far as contact tracing goes, if, if, if somebody is left on the bus, including yourself, it's, it's, it's probably because you have not come in close contact with somebody through the contact tracing. So, um, uh, make sure to check. That would, that would be it. I mean, if it was something of that concern, you would be notified, you would probably be in quarantine as well. Um, and I'll save the best for last. That paperwork, it's gone. And I want to thank our superintendent and this wonderful division of leadership team because a lot of times they've got a lot going on their plate. They really do. And 
we, we spent a lot of time talking about this specific issue and for everybody to kind of come together, uh, everybody was there, they listened, they heard, and, and we, can, we can take that off their plate. We do have a plan moving forward, but the receiving chart paperwork that is in your hands is no longer your concern. So there you go. Please, please, please understand that we've got to finish rolling out the process that begins on Monday, but it's all done, you've been heard. So at least I at least ended it on a good note on that part. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Johnson just said is that another thing just so you're aware of 
Um, on the county government side, we've been schools have been collaborating with them, but they they have put forward a grant um, to be able to provide high speed Wi-Fi to every home in Henrico. So keep your fingers crossed. Um, if you happen to be a home that, that doesn't have that service available now, um, hopefully in the near future that may be something that's available to you. Um, and then the other thing, you asked a question about the school calendar. Thank you for that question. Um, the calendars were passed at the um, second meeting in August, I believe it was August 26th, and next year we will start one week prior to Labor Day and we will get out one week earlier in June. So it was just a shifting of the calendar one week. And we've actually adopted the following year for 23, 24, and we will shift it one more week. And then prior to Labor Day, so we'll start two weeks prior to Labor Day. And I believe the last day of school that year will be May 31st. And um, that will line us up with our regional partners. Um, and there was lots of, of conversations about the benefits of that to our students. So um, that's the calendars as, as already passed for 22-23 and 23-24. So thank you. Yeah, the calendars are on our website um, so that you can see them. Uh, no. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Excuse me. Excuse me. One moment, ma'am. We'll get your um, information and make sure that we get calendars to you in hard copy. Okay. I, I actually think that if you're going to have a meeting like this, you should bring hard copies for a lot of things because even though I do have Wi-Fi, I am not only talking about me. I am a parent. I am. A member that tries to help my community. So if I am going out of my way to ask these questions, it's because a lot of parents are not here to be able to ask. Now, and, and your point is well taken. We often um, discuss this at our board meetings as well, how not everything uh, just needs to be virtually and online. It also still needs to exist in paper form too. So thank you for sharing that. Really, your feedback is noted. recommendation related to contact tracing is three feet to the greatest extent possible and we've always tried to get the maximum amount that we can but we also know we have to deal with the capacity of our buses and the capacity of our classrooms and so that's why we have the other layered mitigation strategies to help protect our um, students and our employees Yeah. 
childhood because as anybody who had kids go through Long Island Elementary, whatever formula you guys are using does not work for the Mountain Road Corridor. And knowing that several large tract plans have just recently been purchased for development along the Mountain Road area, I would really, really like to have my kids maybe have one year that's not overcrowded because of the way that the county decides how many kids will move in when it's completely inaccurate. So I would like to get some assurances that the new schools and the expanded schools will not immediately be overrun as soon as all these new neighborhoods are being approved, as well as all the stuff that you're doing out on the Yeah, that's a good, good question. I think if you, you mentioned the 39 home thing, uh, I, I want to say that might be the development that's been proposed off of uh, Old Mountain right there. Yes. Um, for one, we, um, that one specifically, I don't want to talk about specifics because your question is actually relevant across the board. Well, yeah, but I mean, that one specifically, that's well, the that one specifically won't pass. My kids went through one in elementary as well, and I haven't uh, in three years that I've been on this board, I, don't, I have not approved a uh, single family home development in Brooklyn that has been under 55 years of age. So the Brooklyn North, Brooklyn South developments across from Glenelg High School are 55 and older. Um, matter of fact, they applied for single family housing zoning and I denied it until they moved it over 55 for your exact reason. Uh, that development you're talking about, well, I, I spoke with the developer four or five days ago. Uh, it's not going to fly. It's just number one, the intersection, but number two, schools. Um, and number three, uh, and, I, and this is probably unknown, so I'm happy to share it. Our chairs and vice chairs meet uh, regularly between the school board and the board, and we talk about that regularly. Not only do we talk individually, but we meet as chair, vice chair, and we discuss those exact things about what development cases are coming and what aren't. I think recently you've seen some significant population increase in the three chop area. The census just came back, and there's 75,000 residents in that district, where the rest of us have about 67,000. So you've seen that pop in that three chop, mostly apartments and multifamily housing. Um, in Brooklyn specifically, because it's a Brooklyn community meeting tonight, I will tell you that um, I have been reluctant, if not never, I, I dare say, I don't remember a case where we've approved some single family housing in Brooklyn in the last three years because of your exact same question. What we're seeing in Brooklyn is we're seeing some redevelopment. For example, the Laurel Lakes area is one that's coming right there on Hungry and Woodman. It used to be an old rundown shopping center. We are going to approve townhomes and apartments in there. It falls in a school window that does have capacity, which is uh, Brooklyn and Urbanage in that, that window. Uh, to answer a question earlier, I think that's going to sell up there. It's a great question. It's um, a new Fairfield Elementary School. The Route 1 corridor at Green City is actually in Fairfield. And uh, I think Ronnie answered it really, really well. There's, a, there's an elementary school plan for there already on the capital improvement. So to answer your first part, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tig and answer the, the formula piece. But I will assure you that Mr. Kinsella and I talk regularly, and there will not be uh, increased development in Brooklyn because uh, Dr. Cashwell, the county manager, and myself, uh, the chair and vice chair, Mr. Cooper, and Ms. Shea, we talk regularly about that. And the capacity of Glenelg High School, in addition to Glenelg Elementary, is not spectacular for that. So we guard against that regularly. There are some areas and pockets in the county where development it makes sense, but in our corridor right here, it does not. And that mountain road one you talked about, um, that, that's not going to that's not going to go. But thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Tech. And when we're looking at capacity, when a project comes forward and considering capacity, you know, we're looking at the information being provided by the developers, the type of housing, and, and what's projected, you know, what we see across the county in that type of housing. And so, and I'm happy to talk if you have more specific questions. I know we can um, answer those. Can you tell me what the classroom capacity for a high school classroom is supposed to be for students? How many? 35 students are in a classroom in a high school right now. Yeah. I think it would vary from building to building based on the, the, the actual size of the classrooms. So there isn't like just one specific number that every, every classroom is the same capacity across the county. Are you talking class size class or size. space? Okay, I'm sorry. How many kids are permitted in one classroom and within, well, I know you said they're all different, but I'm they, 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 they are. They are. My daughter has 33 students in her class, in the English class. So I know, first of all, there's not be three feet between 
Right, and, and so, you know, it does vary based on um, staffing and master scheduling as far as what the class sizes, the, when you think about class sizes versus capacity of a classroom, um, it can vary and there's a lot of factors that, that impact that within a school that's or a with a master class. schedule. That, that should, that's a collide for class. So I have concerns about students and special needs are actually getting their needs met when they request a collaborative class and there are 33 students in there. And, and we'll be happy to connect with you directly so that we have specifics from you and not make that public here, but we'll be happy to talk with you this evening, okay? Thank you. Any last questions? Last call for questions. So we have two more, I see two more. Okay, me again. Uh, I have a question about one of the school board policies and I wanna make sure that I'm understanding it correctly um, because the way I read it, 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 it appears that we might have some issues, but I'm referring specifically to uh, policy P405-012. It's titled duty-free period, and it reads, each middle and high school teacher shall be provided one planning period per day, or the equivalent unencumbered of any teaching or supervisory duties. And so my question is, for teachers who have a study hall during their planning period, how shall we interpret that? Because it says no teaching or duties. It should be unencumbered. So I teach three classes and then I go straight to a study hall. How, how should I interpret that? I'll let Dr. Dr. Todd take that one. The way the, the code reads is it you know goes back to the traditional time of when there was seven or eight period day. And so um, the expectation is that over the course of, you know, with being on the alternating schedule between the two days that you would have a full unencumbered planning period. And so if, and, you know, if you want to talk about it, um, you know I'm here. Okay? Hi, I'm a 11th grader at Glen Allen, and my question is, uh, or more concern, I have e-lunch one of my days at, at that 1.50 p.m. Uh, and then I go to cross-country practice right after school, and so that's like two hours, which kind of is a little bit difficult, especially when running, and for, especially for other athletes as well. As well. So if you have any like idea of why that is, or kind of, kind of understand my concern, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes that's a little bit difficult, especially if I get to school at like 8.45 and I'm not eating until 1.50. And of course with COVID precautions, you can't eat during class, which I completely understand. Um, just if you guys have any guidance on that, I guess. You're definitely heard, and we'd love to uh, be able to help you work with your school to understand what maybe the master scheduling challenges that resulted in that, and maybe what we might be able to do, uh, if not something that would change that schedule, uh, perhaps provide an opportunity for you to have some nourishment for your busy day. Uh, that's certainly a, a concern we can all understand, uh, and so thank you for sharing that. Well, I certainly want to thank everyone for checking in tonight, whether you were here in person or live streaming with us. Um, this was a lot of um, good information, good feedback was given, and all of, all of everything is noted. Um, and I'm certain my colleagues in the school board will be watching this as well if they didn't already this evening. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and caring enough to uh, give the feedback and take the time because we're all in it to do what's best for our, for our students, teachers, staff, and families, and of course, most important, our students. But just thank you so much. And as Dan Schmidt mentioned earlier, he and I are always available. I mean, I'll give you my work cell phone. It's out on the internet, 592-7538. I'm always available by email. Um, KB Kinsella at henrico.k12.va.us. 
you know, please, you know, I work for you, so please let me know what I need to know so I can advocate for you. Thanks so much, and have a good night.